my favorite historical figures are cavalrymen. And when I was doing my uh, writing my thesis, a lot of my research consisted of reading their memoirs. They wanted to be seen as being bold, being courageous. The Polish winged hussar, of course, has like two strips of wood that come over their shoulders and it's like all these uh, feathers. Their charge is ridiculous. Like they are probably the epitome of heavy cavalry in um, at least in Europe. And I just thought of this, Jim. How come a cavalryman never uh, carries cash on him? I don't know. Because they charge everything. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. Uh, it's Mounted Combat on WebD Up. This episode is brought to you by Dungeon Fog. They're holding a special event on the weekend of May 30th, the Game Masters Workshop. They're teaming up with World Anvil, How to Be a Great GM, and mapmaker Kiara to bring you a two-day system agnostic online event to help Game Masters of all abilities create intriguing campaigns, exciting settings, and engaging encounters. So if you're a newer GM, this is a great opportunity to workshop your skills, give feedback to others, and get feedback yourself on your world building. Visit circleofworldbuilders.com for more information, link in the comments and description. All right, Jim, let's get talking about some mounted combat. We're really talking about the intersection of uh, this very complicated and, and involved uh, form of warfare mm -hmm. with like tabletop RPGs and all of their romanticization of the past, yeah. uh, all of their abstraction. I don't know that I've ever really seen it done well. I've seen some RPGs that get really close. Yeah. Um, the big RPGs, right? The D&D &D and the like. It, mounted combat is something that seems to be based more on an idealized form of sports i.e. the joust, mm -hmm. than actual mounted combat. And it's one of those things that I think for DMs and players alike, that if they want a character or they want to feature mounted combat in their games, it's worth it to like take some inspiration from how it was actually practiced so that um, they have an idea for like mechanical improvements or enhancements, mm -hmm. uh, character concepts, as well as just like how do you... Uh, how do you feature this in a game that so often is about like going down into dungeons <laughs> as a squad of, of you know, four to five people? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's kind of hard to bring a horse uh, into that that low hanging cave. Um, oh, certainly. And also certainly. it seems like a lot of people just expect what they see in like television and movies. And that's oh, not yeah. really an accurate reflection of what mounted combat really is. It really isn't. It's yeah. not the Battle of the uh, Bastards, Jim. You really like? <laughs> yeah, not not really. Not so much. Uh, you know, it's kind of hard to get a horse to run into a solid object like that, especially if it's sharp. Wait, horses um, have a, a sense of self-preservation? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You really have to do a lot to get a horse to to want mm -hmm. to fight, actually. Um, and so it's like I, I'm hoping that uh, you know our viewers will, will both be a little educated uh, about this, but also like really have some inspiration. Inspiration yeah. for their own games because that's ultimately what it's all about. Because it's the cavalry, right? Yeah, it's and the so cavalry, yeah, there's certainly. some different kinds of cavalry. So we should at least talk about all. They should at least get their due. <laughs> certainly, yeah. And and this is um, this is one of those things where when I was studying my my master's degree and and it was at, it was in uh, cavalry and mounted combat specifically that uh, weird period where they're still wearing full plate armor but there's guns on the battlefield as well. It's this transitionary period for cavalry. Wait, full plate but, and guns? Yes, I just, I just heard a million right? voices cry <laughs> in the wilderness. Cry yeah, it's kind of weird that there was nearly two hundred year period where that was the case. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> We'll, we'll right. get to guns in a second, um, <laughs> exactly. but yeah, light cavalry. Let's start. Let's go to low, yeah. low to low to heavy or light to heavy. We will. Yeah, say. light cavalry is uh, representative number one of like the very first types of cavalry that ever existed uh, when the transition from chariot to a uh, horse rider, and to me, like light cavalry is one of those types of cavalry that if you're gonna have a, a pre-modern army. If you're gonna have, and you and you want some kind of cavalry, light cavalry is the one that you want, mm -hmm. simply because at kind of a base they are uh, a mounted ranged combatant, usually really light in terms of their equipment. They wear little to no armor. Uh, their horses don't wear armor, and they really rely on speed and deception to uh, perform their combat role. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's only one that they really perform. They are also scouts communications, uh, they raid in a protracted campaign. They're the ones who are going to be ranging out into the countryside, raiding the enemy uh, and the like. Yeah, um, this is more of your, for <laughs> folks out there, this is more of your attack on Titan 
Uh, sure. Yes, the the scout yeah. corps that goes out beyond the wall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, they are ranging outwards. Uh, like the Dothraki would be a, a a good example of that. My favorite in in real life are the Mongolian uh, horse archers from the uh, from the steppe, and oh, yeah. they're sort of the the most developed, I, I should say, or, or I guess the most recent that a lot of people have a frame of reference mm-hmm. for. But certainly the most emulated. F- right. Right, yeah. And it's like there's something about the Central Asian steppe that seemed to produce every few generations a new group of of nomads. And they all seem to practice the same form of combat, which was a small core of of heavy uh, cavalry, which we'll get to later. And then this much larger group of uh, light cavalry that because of the nature of their lifestyle, because the fact that they literally learn how to ride before they can walk in some cases and the use of bow and lasso and other things to uh, just feed themselves also lend themselves very well to waging a very effective style of war. Mm -hmm. Light cavalry just does so much in terms of its usefulness to a, a general. I just can't see it being anything other than essential. And it also happens to be the one that's easiest to emulate in a typical RPG uh, kind of setting. How do you envision like a character like that looking? Like what would mm-hmm. what would that be? Some of the characteristics of light cavalry that I see is a sense of fearlessness. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times because they're not wearing a lot of armor, they rely on speed, deception, and, and boldness to do what it is that they do. For the most part, that's harassing the enemy. So in a fight, um, light cavalry might run up really close or ride up really close to uh, a line of infantry or something, you know, if they have bows or javelins or something. The idea is to provoke the enemy into following them. Right. So feigned retreats, wheeling, all those kinds of things. And when you see their effective use in warfare, you'll see that, it, yeah, it's, it's the enemy that makes a mistake. They break ranks. They think that they can catch these guys. They might send their own heavily armored cavalry after them. And then what they don't realize is that uh, these people are able to ride one way and shoot behind themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, they're able to do crazy things because they spend most of their time on their horse and it just comes naturally to them. Um, some of my favorite stories are of mounted archers or, or horse archers, uh, you know, taking lassos and using them against heavily armored knights to just pull them off their horses or barbed lances or hooked lances and, uh, you know, use the fact that they are so fast and so nimble to just outride and outflank anything that uh, they, they come across. And if they can't defeat it, they can run away very easily. Mm-hmm. To me, that does speak of a kind of combat that's very individualistic and really lends itself well to an RPG format because you don't need to have all of the perfect conditions for, say, a lance charge or something like that. Um, but you can still get a really cool image of this like bold, fearless warrior who disdains armor that's all about speed and that is very, uh, I don't know, wild and mm-hmm. I don't know what you call it, freewheeling, I guess, is, uh, is a good term for it. To me, the kind of characters that work best here are like rangers. Mm-hmm. You know, when I think of a, a, a horse archer, particularly one of those uh, from the steppe, but let's be clear, we're not just talking about horse archers when we talk about uh, light cavalry. Sometimes the light cavalry, use, like I said, uses javelins. Other times they have uh, melee weapons, but they're using a support role only. You're mm-hmm. not going to see them, you know, charging into enemy lines, but you might see them riding down a fleeing enemy mm-hmm. that needs to be, uh, you know, taken care of. Well, and also the thing to consider about, uh, I think, is to consider about cavalry is its effect on weapons development. Like certain weapons that were developed, like the more curved blade, so you can slash as you go and your weapon doesn't get hung up, or say the augmentation to the, uh, the longbow. Making uh-huh. it shorter uh-huh. on the bottom half so it can be used on a on a horse. What you'll see in terms of technology is that uh, step nomads are very often the ones that introduce horse equipment that is later adopted by more settled populations. So things like a certain kind of saddle mm-hmm. uh, that, say, the Romans would use. Uh, evidence comes that they got it from <laughs> their own version uh, <laughs> of the uh, step peoples there. Or like stirrups, which began as like a, a rope with some loops on the end that you throw over your horse. So there's a lot to do with like equipment and how it's used and technological advance. And I think when you couple that with an attitude of fearlessness and decisive action, then you really get a kind of character who is flamboyant, um, bold, uh, risky, even even maybe like foolhardy in terms of the kinds of things that they uh, would do. And to me, that like screams player character, Mm -hmm. right? And so if it were me, this is one of those things where it's like play a ranger or something the equivalent of 
and run circles around your enemy while you pepper them with arrows. Yeah. And then as they're weakened, then you ride in on them and uh, cut them down. And I mean, and we'll get to more fantastic mounts uh, in a bit. Certainly. But I do want to, I have to bring up, like I, I did play a ranger one time that was a halfling that rode a, a wolf. Oh, yeah. Uh, because I wanted to be Princess Mononoke. But it was my <laughs> attempt to do mounted combat. And it was a yeah. lot of fun because... It's a lot of fun. It's, it's, yeah. a lot, it's really quick. And, you know, you can strike and move and get in and out. Or your mount can uh, can take some hits. And I think that's, that's one of can. the things is, you know, what is a mounted combatant without a mount? So when it comes to considerations like that, whether mechan- like mechanical considerations, uh, what, what, what do you see uh, as, as, as what to focus on. First off, an understanding that uh, horses did not survive battles. They died all the time. There's a reason why, the uh, say, the Mongolians would carry 10 horses to battle per one soldier if they could. Uh, knights would have uh, four to five their own because they died all the time. And guess what? They're super expensive to replace uh, because you have to get the horse used to the smell of blood, the, the clash of weapons, that kind of thing. So in terms of like an RPG, this is really kind of one of the one of the chief hurdles that you're going to have to get over. And to me, it's it's a it's both an acceptance that your mount is going to die because you brought them into combat <laughs> and also finding a way to mitigate that, whether it's having a lot of mounts, having a way to bring the mount back to life, having a mount that like levels with you or is tied somehow to your stats of some kind. If you're talking about fifth edition D&D, there's a lot of different ways to accomplish that. Mm-hmm. But uh, that really does get into more of the fantastic uh, kind of stuff as well. It should, right? It's D&D. But it's D&D. Uh, would you yeah. allow Revivify on a mount? Sure. Yeah, yeah I would. That's what I thought. Yeah, why not? All right. Speaking <laughs> of jumping hurdles, let's go ahead and jump up to uh, medium. Uh, cavalry. Yeah, yeah. Medium cavalry is one of those weird ducks because it can outfight anything that is lighter than it and outrun anything heavier than it. And so what you find with light cav- or medium cavalry, which to me, like the English demi lancer of the late Renaissance, early modern era is the quintessential type, three quarters plate armor, pistol, lance and sword. A uh, horse is completely unarmored itself. You know, if they accompany light cavalry, they are there to support them in melee combat or something like that. If they accompany heavy cavalry, they are there to flank, pursue, uh, provide range support, that sort of thing. This is the type that I studied the most in uh, getting my degree. And uh, you'd read these reports of people who would, um, you know, fight a battle or something or command a squadron of cavalry in battle Mm -hmm. and then just sing high praises for this sort of cavalry. The chief criticism being that heavier cavalry doesn't build up enough speed in order to truly deliver the kind of psychological shock that you need to, to effectively engage in a, in a lance charge. And that also you just get to fight more often, right? <laughs> These are people who are like, I just want to fight. Like, don't keep me in camp. Don't put me on garrison duty. Like, send me out into the countryside. I'll find where the enemy is. I'll raid their lines. I will, uh, you know, secure, uh, you know, a bridgehead for the main army or something. Mm-hmm. And we're now getting into like part of the RPG territory where it's more and more difficult to model. And, and there's a lot more uh, mechanical hurdles to overcome. But I also look at these sorts of cavalrymen, even more so than light cavalry. These are the sorts of uh, mounted soldier that epitomize the flamboyance and boldness of cavalry. Another really good example would be like the Hussar, Mm -hmm. uh, which is a a type of Polish and Eastern European cavalry, not necessarily the winged Hussars, which are more heavy cavalry. You know, they were like jaguar skin cloaks, great big furry hats and uh, drooping mustaches. You know, they are there to, uh, you know, deliver a saber charge at speed, you know, at full gallop. The idea with all of that is to like psych out your enemy to the point that they break ranks before you make contact. Right, right. The advantage that medium medium has over heavy is that if they need to abort that attack, they can easily wheel around and uh, get away, whereas it's harder for uh, heavy cavalry to do that. Oh, most definitely. I think that, uh, I think in Berserk, there's a great example of that where they're taking one of the cities (laughs) and uh, Guts leads a charge against the purple rhino knights and they're all big heavy uh, Mm -hmm. and and, uh, (laughs) manages to stave that charge because of maneuverability. There's a lot of great cavalry in that that show, by the way. There's a lot. And and like, uh, don't be fooled. You can use a two-handed weapon from horseback. There's two-handed lances. There's giant bows that they use. Like most Chinese cavalry, as I understand it, use two-handed weapons from uh, horseback. So it is possible. I really do think of um, someone who is both disciplined 
and is able to unlock their um, their ferocity at will. And to me, that speaks to a, like a barbarian cavalryman, oh, yeah. uh, someone who <laughs> you know, someone who's like when they need to, they can uh, just let it all out and give everything they can to the charge, to the, the, the clash of arms and don't hold anything back because if they do, they're screwed. They don't have the armor mm-hmm. to deal with a protracted melee uh, with infantry or even other cavalry, really. If they don't break their enemy immediately, they have to get out of there fast. <laughs> it strikes a balance between discipline and then also the idea that your individual honor may or may not be at stake but that isn't always like the primary thing you're concerned about. Well, it sounds like you need to come up with totem of the horse, Jim. Uh, yes, I mean for real though, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to me, like I think a lot of cavalry that you see depicted in media is more medium, like it, yeah. it, that that I remember. Like uh, yeah, and so that's the you know having the pistol and you toss that aside. Maybe you have a spear or a lance. And then you get down to the sword where you're in the blood and guts, but you got to keep going. Because these had their their heyday during this transitionary period, like they're experimenting with all different ways to fight. Sometimes they've, they're solely armed with pistols mm-hmm. and they engage in very fancy battlefield maneuvers, or at least they wrote about it in their manuals. We're not sure exactly what it looked like on the battlefield because nobody's seen it. But one of the things that they were notable for was the use of a pistol in close range combat. Part of the reason why the lance was abandoned is because it really isn't very effective, except, except in this narrow range of circumstances where if you put a pistol to somebody's helmet and shoot them, that's all you need. Yeah. <laughs> this is the sort of level of brutality that these uh, cavalrymen would engage in where uh, when they get mixed up, it's pistols put you know, against a breastplate or against a helmet and then fired. Or sometimes they kill the horse that the rider's on because that's what you do. Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, a lot of times, don't you just go for the horse instead of the rider? Because Sure, yeah. If you don't want to loot them yourself, right? Like the, a big part of warfare during this time is like, oh, yeah, we got the enemy's cavalry. We got their horses because right. it's really expensive <laughs> to train war horses. <laughs> I cannot stress that enough. It's really expensive. Yeah. Um, in terms of mechanical considerations for this, I think that if you're not using encumbrance and you're not like penalizing a horse's movement or the mount's movement for how much they're carrying, this distinction between light, heavy, and, and or light and medium and, and heavy is less and less meaningful. Uh, and so if you want to use the divisions, you want to like give some variety, then consider some kind of encumbrance system, not count up how many pounds you have, but something that takes into account the weight of the rider and the equipment that is burdened, uh, the, mm-hmm. you know, the horse is burdened by. Oh yeah, definitely something like a slot system. You know, if you have armor, it fills a slot. If the horse has armor, that fills two slots, you know, yeah. uh, depending on what weapons array you have, you know, and then based on yeah. however many slots you have left open, <laughs> that's your bonus to speed or something yeah, like that. Yeah, something that, that gives you a way to differentiate between the various loads uh, of equipment that the mm-hmm. different cavalrymen have. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the the heaviest load of equipment, the, the heavy cavalry. We've seen this. Uh, it's, <laughs> seen this, know. yeah. This is this is the one that most people are familiar with. Yeah. Like, these are knights. Yeah. You know, they're they're clad head to toe in as much armor as they can get. They put their horses in armor. Yeah. Um, they use a and, winch and this... to get on their horse. <laughs> Oh, well, that's, that is a, a slanderous and <laughs> uh, bald face uh, deception there, Pruitt. I just wanted uh, to get you going. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know that they didn't do that. <laughs> but I, I don't mind speaking to that for a minute because it, it has a basis in reality because mm-hmm. the weight of equipment is one of the reasons why you see cavalry give up the lance, give up the uh, the heavy armor. It's not just because of firearms. In, in fact, they began developing armor that was bulletproof, which is where the sort of term comes from, um, but the weight of it prevented a gallop. And so the kind of charge that these knights were able to deliver was really weak. And and a lot of times uh, you read these stories where two groups of them would just ride past each other. No one's hurt. No mm-hmm. one's harmed. It, you know, it, it's a it's like a ballet or it's a, a dance. practice run. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Except, you know, you're supposed to fight them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so to me, the heyday of, of heavy armor or sorry, heavy cavalry in uh, at least in Europe, Europe was like the early Renaissance. It's where you get the articulated full plate, the uh, white harness is sometimes called. And it's also where you start getting the plate armor for horses. Mm-hmm. And it, there's this brief window where it's able to repel you know, the arrows of longbowmen, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some crossbowmen. It really takes like a steel cabled like a huge crossbow to penetrate the armor. 
then guns come about and that penetrates that armor and you get in the arms race. But like the appeal and uh, on the battlefield of heavy cavalry is that if you're an infantryman, someone that's just been, you know, recruited into a regiment or, uh, you know, maybe you didn't even have that, <laughs> that option. Someone told you you had to do this. Yeah. They and rode up <laughs> to your farm one day and put a spear in your hand and said, get in line. Yeah. And get in line. And you're facing down someone clad head to toe in the best armor possible atop a war horse that has been bred for its ferocity, discipline, and ability to not care that it's about to run into you. And you know that this person is trained all of their life to do that and that they have such a contempt for you as a person that they can't wait, you know, to spear you with their lance. Now you're that person in the front. Imagine you're like five people back and you can't even see any of this. You just see the dust of the cavalry as it charges at you. This is what they mean by shock. It's not like the physical impact of cavalry with infantry. It's the psychological impact of seeing that. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever had the experience of being next to a mounted police officer as they're trying to crowd control or just around a horse in general, you really understand why this is so effective because they are big animals. Yeah. And if they just move and are not paying attention, they can knock you on your ass. Now, mm -hmm. imagine they're trained to fight with a rider who's trained to fight, who doesn't need reins to control them, that doesn't need uh, you know, to do anything more than just like use pressure from their knees and who has actually spent time learning their weapons and training and has fought before, you can see why they're so devastating. Unfortunately, the conditions that allow that to happen are so narrow that it, it's really not that common. <laughs> most yeah. knights fought on foot um, because most battles in the Middle Ages were sieges. And so you can't bring a horse up a ladder. Uh, you dismount and you fight on foot. And hence why jousting became so popular, because it allowed them to engage in their idealized form of combat as a sport. All that background aside, this is to say that Knights and other heavy cavalry, whether they're Persian cataphracts or, uh, you know, Norman knights or French men at arms, whatever, that they're expensive. They represent a, an aristocratic warrior elite mm -hmm. and that they consider themselves the cream of the crop, even though they're very often do less than medium and light cavalry in battle. For the most part, they're used to deliver a final blow because you can't like gallop in full armor or even canter or something without just completely, you know, losing your stamina. It's one of those things that I think is um, the source of a lot of romantic romanticization, uh, but also one of those things that's the most misunderstood about uh, cavalry. Yeah, it's about as close to you know what the battles actually looked like as Rambo is to actual combat. You know, oh, sure, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, the hero yeah. up on the horse with his full plate, you know. I mean, they wrote yeah. about it because they commissioned bards to, to write stories, probably. Pretty um, much. And at one point, it is very effective. It's just like the amount of training and the amount of uh, expense that it takes to produce them is, is a lot. And you get more bang for your buck by training infantry to just not run, mm -hmm. um, which is ultimately uh, what they did. A uh, lot yeah. of armies did. But I can imagine, though, when you were talking about, you know, being like five ranks back, but feeling the ground rumble, you can feel yeah. the, the charge coming and how that yeah. like that effect that it would have on morale. Um, oh, yeah. People in the front are like are trying to retreat, trying to get out of the way. They're pushing the formation back. And, and most retreats happen from the back anyway. Mm -hmm. It's not the people up front. They don't really have anywhere to go. It's the people who are in the back who don't know what's happening. They can just hear it. Right. That that's where a route usually uh, occurs. But um, I but it's such a classic archetype for fantasy that we shouldn't get rid of it. No. However, it's the most difficult to incorporate into a typical tabletop RPG. In my experience, um, the Pendragon RPG is one of the only RPGs I've seen that actually handles this well. Um, it has three different types of combat, individual skirmish and battle. And in battle, you you know, you lead a lance charge. You have to make a horsemanship roll. You have to make a valor roll to, to psych yourself up to do it. Then the impact, uh, you know, is, is, is played out. And then you have to successfully extract yourself from the melee, move back in line and do it all over again. Mm -hmm. And it's that element that when I played it, I was like, this conforms to what I know about how these things went, that, that they took a lot uh, to set up. And I think a lot of RPGs are not willing to go like that granular 
Uh, but you know, an RPG that's specifically about playing knights yeah. <laughs> in a in a mythologized past is is what Pendragon does. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think most RPGs would treat it more like uh, Two Towers, Lord of the Rings. Sure. Where they just yeah. charge into the group, and then they're just kind of standing there on their horses, like fighting. Right. <laughs> uh, you know. Now they could do that. The yeah. heavy cavalry. If you were going to do that, heavy cavalry is the way to do it. And like, there's some Byzantine and, and late Roman cavalry that almost would form phalanxes themselves mm -hmm. with their horses and fight that way. But we're talking very small armies and their opponents were also heavy cavalry mounted on, you know, armored horses. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, you have to do that at that point. Like what, are you, what else are you gonna do? I think the paladin class in D&D &D or a paladin like class fits this rather well, if only because in D&D &D they can create their own mounts. <laughs> so yep. uh, they always have a, a, a horse to ride or something. But it's also that sense of nobility and uh, of of like we're supposed to be here. We are we are the top of the pyramid um, that I see is embodied by the paladin. It's like a literally knight in shining armor. And so yeah, I, I always I imagine the concept. cavalier is more probably like medium or uh... cavalier certainly was yeah yeah um, that's a, an interesting side note. One of the things about the cavalier uh, is that these are you know aristocratic uh, cavalrymen. And they were defeated by a bunch of lawyers and shopkeepers and students uh, on, who, that trained under Oliver Cromwell to just have discipline. Like they didn't run away after a successful charge. They formed back in their line, moved where they needed to, didn't, mm -hmm. didn't exhaust their horses, and then did it all over again. And like that's remarkable because up until that point, being a rider, which meant being able to own a horse, having the time to ride it, all that stuff was the prime requisite for being a cavalryman and taking a bunch of people who've never done that and turning them into a force that could defeat aristocratic cavalry was like mind blowing. Like there's a reason why Oliver Cromwell gets listed as one of the greatest cavalry commanders because of that. That should highlight for like what discipline means for this. That's yeah. the word, the word is discipline. The <laughs> Ironsides are one of those types of cavalry that changed the game. And mm -hmm. after them, you don't really see a lot of aristocratic cavalry. Like you see officers who are aristocrats, but yeah. that's neither here nor there. But if the peasants can, can defeat you, why would you risk it? You know? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> the, the chief thing mechanically for this and the chief hurdle is morale. Yeah. And if you don't have some kind of way to represent panic and uncertainty in your combat, then a lot of the advantages of this type of cavalry go away. Um, and and that's, a, that's, a, that's a challenge, especially for games like D&D &D or, or other tactical combat RPGs, because combat's very rational. And it really is based on like perfect information about the battlefield by all participants. It's more about the players than the characters. Uh, it's intricate in ways that engage, you know, decision making about what my character is going to do, what to use, what abilities to use and the like. But it's not how actual combat goes. Uh, you know, it takes a while for events that happen on in one side of the battlefield to like reach the other side. Uh, it, it takes a while for anybody to really figure out what's going on. And I'm not talking about like the ones where it's like the battle lines a mile long or more. I'm talking about small skirmishes between mm -hmm. less than 20 people that they happen so fast and are over so quickly that it's hard to like figure out what's going on. And like that doesn't describe D&D <laughs> &D, uh, combat at all. It's lengthy. You got all the time in the world to make a decision. Uh, you know, you, you approach it from like a rational perspective of like what's the most optimal choice to defeat our enemies. And like yeah. none of that conforms to, you know, <laughs> armed blanche, the, you know, the cold steel of combat as, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. And like without that, you lose something. And I think that you see that when you go looking online for people who are have, have problems with mounted combat and they're like, gosh, what should I do? How do I make this work? Like, this isn't, this doesn't work for my game or something. Um, and you're just running up against the problems of, you know, tactical combat and tabletop RPGs. Uh, just, you know, you gotta do something, <laughs> you gotta do something about that first. Seems yeah. to me you get rid of initiative. Everybody just goes at the same time right. and whoever rolls their damage <laughs> die first and calls it out. <laughs> Yeah, that's, yeah. That's Whoever gets hit first. <laughs> it's a free for all. It's like yeah. the stock market, but for D and D. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like as, so as you can see, there's a lot of like hurdles that you would need to overcome to use mounted combat in a game that 
was any, anything close to what, uh, you know, actually existed. Not that that's necessarily your goal, but. Well, yeah, but I mean, like having what actually existed, a nice, a nice. Uh, it's a baseline. Yeah, baseline to go to go from. Let's move into the more the fantasy, the game part of it. So let's first off talk about fantasy mounts, because yes. this is where we get to change from just horses. And, you know, in real life, we did have they did have elephant riders. Um, oh, yeah. Camel, all kinds camel of Camel riders. I mean, like, there are different kinds of cavalry. But mm-hmm. this is d and I mean, we got dragons. You know, there's fantasy mounts galore. There's different, you yeah. know, whether it's a, mounted in the air, you could be mounted at sea. You could ride a yeah. killer whale into battle. Exactly. You know? Yeah. It, it quickly gets out of hand, even. Like, how would this work? How, what would this look like? And this is where I think the romanticization of the night, and I, keep, I feel like I'm going to get a lot of flack for how I'm pronouncing that, uh, is one of those things that leads to like, well, my dragon rider is, you know, is a knight. Like, well, how does that work? Like, how do they joust? Why would they have a melee weapon? Aren't they too small mm-hmm. to like even reach the enemy when they're on the back of a dragon? Like, not why not just lance. use a bow? Well, that's, <laughs> and they're huge, right? The dragon lances are gigantic yeah. in order to do that. Yeah. When I start getting into like fantasy mounts, I'm I'm like, all right, we're, we've we we've left so much behind that we might as well just go nuts with uh, what you can do. So to me, like fantasy mounts might be, I'm, I'm riding an Allosaurus or a T-Rex and, you know, hurling javelins and axes and the like as, uh, you know, you can't touch me. You know, dragon riders. Good luck with that. Yeah. Dragon dino riders, riders. Yeah. I don't know who owns dino riders even anymore. Exactly. It's too bad. They should bring it back. And here's another thing to think about, Jim. If, if this is D&D. Yeah. So what happens whenever you hire a mercenary who's a centaur and you literally pay him so that you can ride him as a mount into battle, but he mm. himself can fight with a sword and a shield or a lance of his own while you're on sure. his back being mobile artillery. I mean, to yep. me, like, that's that's how I would do it. I know centaurs don't do that. But sure, sure. Well, yeah, enough player money. character centaurs, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that reminds me a lot of, like, the ancient German cavalry that the Romans would use, which were said to have an infantryman that would grab a hold of the main and run alongside the cavalry. And the whole point there was that they formed a two-person team. The rider on their mount would attack high, the infantrymen would attack low, and they terrified uh, their Celtic counterparts. Like, the the reputation was just, like, tremendous. I can see it similar with uh, with uh, a centaur, because it's like, I'll carry you into battle, and then once, it, once we get stuck in, you're going to dismount and trip up that person while I'm going to press the advantage mm-hmm. here, and then we need to get out of here, you hop on back and we'll get out of here. To yeah. me, that sounds like the perfect <laughs> way to do it. I mean, come on. Right. I mean, you could do the similar thing with, like, your druid mount, right? Like, yeah, uh-huh. why don't you uh, wild shape into a giant elk, and I'm going to ride on the back of you. We, we'll get there, we'll mix it up in combat and then we're going to gtfo afterwards <laughs> right right like that's the kind of thing you can do um the other thing i would take inspiration from from real life is like one of the reasons you use camels is that horses are terrified of them when you use a camel and and there were plenty of uh, cultures that use camels as cavalry like they tend to be pretty effective against horses mm-hmm. and i start looking at like the way the various monsters of DD interact and how many of them eat horses Oh, like yeah. griffins, griffins and the like, you know, <laughs> that that's got to be factored in somehow, some way, I think. And even if it's like a horse adjacent monster, like a Pegasus or a Hippogriff or something, having the mounts react differently to what they're fighting is, I don't know, a way to add a wrinkle to mounted combat and like to let your players think just a little bit like, all right, how do I want to do this? I have to flesh it out a bit more. But mm-hmm. I, I like the idea of <laughs> like griffins eating the knight's cavalry in the middle of a battle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What was, was that? Uh, like, oh, Jim, what was the, the, the mount? Was it that you that gave it to me or was it the game that Audie ran? I think it was a manticore. Ooh. Did you let me file spider. down the spikes so I could yeah. ride its back Yeah. and put my, like put that. my saddle on it because I raised it from, uh, anyway, <laughs> from I don't know. All I remember I don't remember, I don't awesome. remember running that, but I like that. I like that idea. Of course, manticore, you talk to it, have to listen to it, gripe at you and everything. Uh, <laughs> But obviously, for more for characters and more what's in line with the uh, the sort of mounts that you get, uh, you know, low level spiders are a good one, mm-hmm. dire wolves, that kind of thing. But beyond that, there's like finding a way to get the fine steed or uh, greater fine steed spell is, I would say, not like requisite or or you know, if you don't, you shouldn't engage. You know, if you don't have it, you shouldn't engage in this. But it's pretty handy. Yeah. Um, having played a paladin who made extensive use of fine steed to be a lance armed mount, you know, charging heavily armored warrior, mm-hmm. like the ability to just like summon it and call it uh, pretty much at will uh, was really handy. Um, 
I wouldn't discount Phantom Steed, the third level uh, ritual, especially for like a mounted archer type. Um, if it yeah. takes any damage, it disappears, but you know, it's got a hundred foot speed. And, you know, with Sharpshooter, there's really no reason for it to be anywhere near in danger. <laughs> no, no, you should be just running circles around the combat. Right. I need you to just run in a circle and keep it keep yes. it 100 feet away. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, to round it out, I would just say, like, figurines of wondrous power are another way to oh, yeah. allow a, a mounted character to have a mount that they can say, all right, well, I'm going in the dungeon. I'm going to take my figurine, put it in my pocket. And then you're also not going to use it that much. So the limitation, mm -hmm. you can only use it X number of times per you know, time period is less of a, a challenge there. Yeah, but you might have that big interaction in, in a giant throne room or the big cavern and you actually get a chance to pop out your ebony fly or your ebon fly and you yeah. hop on it. Uh, that's yeah, always, it's that's always been the one I wanted. The mount, Never gotten the fly it. mount. <laughs> the giant fly that you can hop on and fly. Around. Oh um, yes, yes. Uh, so, so let's get into let's get let's kind of round this out here, Jim. We've kind of been mm -hmm. kind of talking about some character concepts, but yeah. maybe we can fold that in with some plot hooks, yeah. like uh, yeah. ways ways you can get people uh, hooked into a more uh, cavalry mindset. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd say if you want to feature it more, a plot hook to introduce is a war. Mm -hmm. You know, like and have the PCs be caught up in it somehow. You know, this is one where cavalry is actually a great place for PCs in a in an army and in a, a say a medieval war because they're very often sent out on their own. So they have to show individual initiative, which is like unheard of in the Middle Ages. Uh, they, you know, practically deny that it's even possible. Um, they have to be bold, fearless. They have to be able to plan things on their own without the benefit of having a, a higher level commander around. So like that really says to me, you put all of them on the mounts, like you mm -hmm. put all of the party on a mount and then uh, let them choose the sort of role that they want to engage in, whether it's just like I ride here, then I dismount which is a type of cavalry that we didn't really talk about, or if they want to arm themselves with a lance and, and, and really mix it up in combat uh, or in melee, they can. I really like the idea of doing something about the scarcity of mounts, whether it's like, yeah, you know, we, we were engaging this like magical horse breeding program to, to make the perfect war horse or something, which I think they do in Eberron. Um, and like, yeah, we, we lost our stud. Yeah. <laughs> we, you got to go get him back. Mm -hmm. uh, or whether it's like not even that, but it's like a mythical horse. The idea of a magic horse is sort of all over the place in mythology. Oh, yeah. And so having one gotta of those. You got to go find Shadowfax. You got to go find him, right? Like, yeah, we all the horses are, you know, descend from this one great uh, stallion or mare or whatever. And, uh, you know, we need you to go find it again. <laughs> we need mm -hmm. you to bring it back, tame it and bring it back. If you can't think of something to do with a wild horse, like a Mustang or something as an adventure, then like, I don't know, like that's pretty low hanging fruit in terms of, oh, in yeah. terms of an adventure. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, looking at, at, at the history of like the American Indians and like how they, once horses got here, how they yes. used them when, you know, their culture didn't really have them before. But they quickly became, they quickly became step people exactly. with like you know the same sorts of tactics and, exactly. and the same kind of culture so that something uh, along yeah. those lines what if a new mm -hmm. mount is is introduced to an area and it's mm -hmm. figuring out how to use this mount effectively yes um uh, another idea i was thinking of uh jim is what happens yeah. whenever um somebody gets to the blacksmith so it's a mystery and there's a there's a you start like in media res and a charge and it falters because all their horseshoes fall apart because yeah. they have like faulty steel or something, so you got to mm -hmm. figure out like a mystery of, you know, what happened. Yeah. Uh, you know, the people making all the the apparatus for the horses, the reins, the bits, and everything uh, start that, yeah. start failing. I can see that. Yeah, so much of it relies on equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, although some of my favorite cavalry warden, they they rode bareback. It, yeah. Like they just it's just it's just them and a horse. Mm -hmm. uh, the Numidians in ancient uh, history are, are kind of like that. Mm -hmm. um, something to do with like just the things surrounding. Uh, a horse like horseshoes saddles stirrups uh those kinds of things because they are ways that like the enemy can sabotage yeah and and like oh we thought we were gonna win this battle and our knights were slaughtered what happened you know they all fell off not, their now, horses <laughs> right they all fell off their horses or the, you know the moment that they were you know supposed to clash the buckle on their saddles broke and they all fell off <laughs> you know yeah the enemy mage developed the new the new deadly spell unbuckle Unbuckle, it's like not, yeah. <laughs> but for horse saddles. <laughs> I, I always tell you. Uh, yeah, I, oh, gosh. 
I mean, then if you're wearing full plate, that would just screw you completely. Right. Uh, <laughs> you can doff armor in an action on people. Yes. Think about yes. that. You know, you're part of the first army that ever uses shock cavalry. You mm -hmm. know, uh, Alexander the Great's cavalry is kind of like that, where they're used as a hammer to the phalanx's anvil. And that's kind of the first time it's really used in mass combat. Guess what? They didn't have stirrups. They didn't yeah. care. They still used the lance. They still, you know, scared the shit out of their uh, mm -hmm. their enemies and performed as heavy cavalry. Um, so yeah, he did that's, pretty that's well, I think. I think, he, I, think I, I think I remember so. reading think, about yeah. him doing all right. He did good. I think he did all right. I think Alexander the Great probably, you know, one of the, one of the all right military <laughs> commanders of, of history. Yes. This is <laughs> underwhelming D&D or world history with Jim and Prue. Three <laughs> villages just like frothing at the mouth watching the video. Yeah. <laughs> if you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. The Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I got, uh, I got the swamp ass. Yeah. I don't oh. normally have all. I don't normally have all my lights on at the same time, so I'm yeah. with the AC off. Oh wait. I love hearing you guys laughing from the next room. It's great. Did you hear my joke, Trav? No, I didn't. Oh, I, didn't I, I, closed, I closed the show with the joke, why does a cavalryman never carry cash on him? Because they charge everything. <laughs> I thought of that Thank about you. 30 seconds before I told it. <laughs> I don't know what it was. It was just like, oh, there it is.